Okay, so this is, oh, oh no, <laughs> it just clicked out of there again. Okay, I'm beginning. Okay, hopefully it's gonna behave itself now. Okay, so the title of the talk is Cave Arthropods of the Southwest. And so the first thing we gotta do is get some definitions out of the way because I'll be using these terms throughout the talk. So a troglobite is an animal that is a cave obligate for its entire life. So its entire life cycle is spent in the cave and it must live in the cave. It cannot live outside of the cave. Okay, a troglophile is an animal that may complete its life cycle in caves, but may also be found on the surface. So it's not obligate cave dweller. And a troglozine is an animal that spends part of its life in a cave and part of its life on the surface. So some examples of these would be for troglobites, some of the blind cave spiders, some of the pseudoscorpions, for troglophiles, some of the millipedes, some centipedes, and many spiders. And for troglozines, things like bats, some kissing bugs, pack rats, and many of the other um, animals that come and go from caves. Okay, so troglomorphy refers to morphological and physiological adaptations for cave life. So this includes reduction or loss of eyes, reduction of pigments, gracilation and elongation of appendages. So when uh, many times this is referred to as attenuation of appendages. Increased tactile and chemical sensitivity. So these uh, take the place of eyesight for many organisms. Degeneration of circadian rhythms. Lowered fecundity and metabolic rates. And increased lifespan. So everything slows down for these animals. And the two main evolutionary pathways to cave life consist of relic populations. For example, in good times, the widespread species expand into caves, and then during bad times, the populations contract and fragment, leaving isolated populations. And the other thing that can happen is adaptive radiation, species that have pre-adaptations to cave life expand into caves, and then positive selection eventually produces new troglobitic species in the cave. So we're gonna give some examples of both of these pathways. And these pathways can run concurrently. They're not mutually exclusive pathways. You can have adaptive radiation at the same time that you can have climate change that strands these, these species in caves. Let's look at Pseudoeurocdinus apachianus. This is from the Santa Rita Mountains. Now, a lot of our caves are associated, in fact, with sky islands in Southern Arizona. And the sky islands are mountain ranges, principally the Catalinas, the Rincons, the Santa Ritas, the Huachucas, and the Chiricahuas are the really big mountain ranges, but the, there's smaller ones like the Whetstones, Paloncillos, and others. A lot of these mountain ranges do have caves associated with them. Now, Pseudoeurocdinus apachianus, this particular individual was collected on the surface in the Santa Ritas in the oak zone near a stream it was right out in, you know, where anyone could walk around and find it. This Pseudoeurocdinus apachianus lives in a cave in the Rincons. This is 20 to 30 miles distant from that surface species that you saw. There's a, basically th these, uh, the cave would be considered one island, if you will, quote unquote, an island population, a relic population of Pseudoeurocdinus apachianus. And the other relic population would be in the Santa Rita's, both in the surface and also on cave, in caves. Um, one reason why 
we think that this might be a relic species is that back over 10,000 years ago, the entire area in Southern Arizona was probably cooler and moister. So these were probably contiguous populations that were not separated. Now that the climate is drier and hotter, there's basically an ocean of dry, hot desert separating these relic populations. This one here in a cave and the other one on a mountain. So uh, this one is located in a cave in the Rincons at an elevation of 3,300 feet. It's in desert where the primary vegetation is Palo Verde, saguaro, and creosote. Temperature exceeds 110 degrees routinely during the summer and relative humidity can be in the single digits. This particular species of scorpion is extremely sensitive to desiccation, so it can only live in the cave. It is an actual obligate cave dweller. Its population is now genetically isolated from all the other Pseudoeuroctinus apachianus, so it is in the process of becoming a troglobite, uh, its own species. Uh, and now the situation is with the Vejovis forhesi group of, of scorpions. There are many, many scorpions in this species group on almost every mountain range in Southern Arizona. There's a, at least one species of uh, Vejovis for something near Vorhezi. This particular one was found in a cave at low elevation. It would never be able to survive outside of the cave. And so it's becoming a troglobite. Um, it's probably a leftover, once again, from when the climate was cooler and moister. And all of these uh, Voorhese type scorpions were probably contiguous throughout Southern Arizona. And now they're stranded in these isolated populations. By the way, scorpions are one of the groups of organisms that you find frequently in caves, partly because they're pre adapted. They can kill prey that's large to their own size, so they can eat a very big meal. And when large prey is available, they're able to deal with it. They don't have to wait for a very small little prey item. They can go ahead and eat a big meal and store all those extra calories in a very large hepatic pancreas, which is kind of like a liver in there in the uh, scorpion. And in that way, they can store the calories for months at a time. So they can eat infrequent large meals, store those calories, and survive long periods of time of fasting, which makes them very ideally suited to, for cave life. Let's look at another uh, group of, of animals that are probably relic species in some caves. Sitelcina Catalina. This one was collected from a cave on the north side of the Catalina Mountains in Southern Arizona. And you have a similar species called Sitelcina Peachii. This one was collected from a cave in Santa Rita Mountains that are roughly 30 miles or more from the uh, Rincon Mountains. And Sitelcina Peachii also occurs very much like Pseudoeuroctinus apachianus, it occurs on the surface in like oak zone close to the edge of streams. So there are surface ones still left. You might observe that these have raptorial pedipalps with spines on them. So they capture things like columbula with these little spines. These are tiny little harvestmen that are only about four millimeters in body length. So they're quite tiny. And here's a Sitelcina peachii that's located in the Rincon foothills over 30 miles away from those Sitelcina peachii that are in the Santa Rita's. So this population of Sitelcina peachii are isolated in a low elevation cave. They don't have any genetic, uh, any gene flow with that population down in the uh, Santa Rita's. The Santa Rita cave population could in theory have gene flow with surface uh, 
uh, ones in the Santa Rita's, but this one here is really a troglobite. It's stuck in the cave. It cannot survive outside of that cave. And it has absolutely no way of getting to those other populations. So it's in the process of becoming its own species too. It just takes time. That's all it takes. Okay, now let's look at some situations of uh, adaptive radiation. So the, the main uh, textbook example of adaptive radiation would be the Darwin finches, where probably an ancestor of those finches arrived on the Galapagos, and then they began to to specialize in various different niches and, and each of the finches developed its own shape of the beak for being able to feed on different things. Well, <clears throat> this is another case of adaptive radiation. This is Albiorix parviventatus, a kind of pseudoscorpion that lives on the surface in Arizona. You can flip rocks almost anywhere in Southern Arizona and find these little guys. And compare the size of these pedipalps to this albiorix, which is found only in two caves in the entire world. This one is probably derived from that surface species, but this one you'll notice that the pedipalps are much more elongated. Let me go back to the surface one. Notice that the length of these claws, the pedipalp arms, are significantly shorter on the surface one than this cave one. So this, this shows some troglomorphic adaptation where the pedipalps have become longer and slender and that allows it to capture prey a little more readily. And uh, these, this particular species is found only in two caves in the entire world and that's Colossal Cave and Arkenstone Cave, which is uh, close by to Colossal Cave uh, in the Rincon foothills of Southern Arizona. Here's another example of a pseudoscorpion that's probably uh, a, a new cave species. It just hasn't been described, but this is a Hesper kernes that was collected in a cave and notice that its body is rather deep pigmented. It's very pale looking. Most Hesper kernes are a lot more brown than that. So this one is losing its pigment. And this was found in a uh, Rincon Foothills cave as well. Um, you'll find that pseudoscorpions, like scorpions, are already pre-adapted for cave life. They can go for long periods of time without eating. They can kill prey that's quite large relative to their own size because they contain venom in their claws. They can actually envenomate a prey animal by simply by grasping it and puncturing the skin of the, the cuticle of their prey with the claws, and they can inject the venom that way. Okay, let's look at, at one of the most classic examples of adaptive radiation, and that's with these Sicurina spiders. Now, Sicurinas are famous because in Texas, there's roughly 50 different species that have been described from different caves in, in Texas. So each cave has its own species of Sicurina. Now, this one happened to come from a cave in Arizona. You'll notice it does have eyes still, but it seems to have somewhat reduced pigment. The legs and the cephalothorax are somewhat transparent, but compare that to this other Sicurina that was collected in the same cave, believe it or not. This one here, you can actually see clean through. It, it's, it's clear, the cephalothorax is clear. You can actually see right clear through to the uh, abdomen, through the spider. And if you look closely, it has no eyes whatsoever. So these Sicurinas that live in caves, sometimes you can have more than one species that has actually evolved in that particular cave. The first one I showed you was actually collected in the same cave as this one here. And one of them was probably a twilight zone hunter. And this one here is probably a deep zone hunter in the same cave. So that's a beautiful example of adaptive radiation where different spiders have e are evolving to different little niches within the cave. Okay, let's talk a little bit about troglozines. So bats live part of their life in, the, in a cave. In this case, it, the cave is uh, actually my front cord, which serves as a suitable facsimile of a cave. Um, 
But bats are critical for caves. They, I would consider them keystone species because what the bats do is that they fly outside of the cave, they ingest either insects or if they're nectar feeding bats, they ingest pollen and nectar. And then they go back to the cave to the roost and they deposit guano there. And the guano serves as food for these little book lice, sosids. The guano itself is not eaten by the sosid. What happens is that mold grows on the bat guano. And these little book lice feed on the mold. So this book louse was actually uh, identified by Ed Mockford. This one was collected in a cave. Here's another book louse. And book lice are, are actually pre-adapted for cave life. Some of them have structures on their heads that absorb moisture from the environment, from just the atmosphere. And so that some of them don't ever have to drink standing water. They can get it just from the atmosphere. And if you've ever been caving and you see little white specks kind of floating around in the air that look like little motes uh, in your headlamp, some of those might be adult, adult book lice. This one here was collected from a cave and and it's an adult with wings and they can fly. The book lice serve as food for things like pseudoscorpions. So the book lice are very tiny. They feed on the fungus, which grows on the bat guano. And then these pseudoscorpions can feed on the book lice. And you'll notice that this Archaeolarca is um, yet another pseudoscorpion from yet another cave in Southern Arizona. So almost every cave has, has its own pseudoscorpions. Um, and Mark Harvey at last month's uh, Lorquin talk uh, mentioned how there were quite a few pseudoscorpions that have been described from caves in Australia as well. Another kind of animal that lives on bat guano and is basically a detritivore are the are thysanurids like uh, fire brats. And this one here is a Nicolatia species. And these are rather rare. There's only been a couple of caves where these have been described as far as I know anyway. Uh, another detritivore is Arenavaga, which are the desert cockroaches. The females and the immatures do not fly. This is a mature female. And this was actually collected from a cave. And of course, the males eventually mature and they have wings and they can disperse from the cave. So these are really just troglophilic. They can live on the surface. They can live in the cave. Um, they're basically pretty adaptable. Wherever there's some sort of detritus for them to feed on, they can live there. Now, this is an interesting one. This is uh, Cymex incrustatus which is a bat bug. So this is a blood sucking parasite that feeds on bats. Yes. And it was collected from a cave, but something that looks more familiar to you is Cymex lectularius, which is the bed bug. So at some point in human history, a bat bug probably transferred its, its a post preference to a bigger, juicier, slower host than the fidgety little bats. And that was humans. Back when humans were living in caves, uh, these cymex probably switched over from bats to humans. And we have that legacy in the form of bed bugs. Okay, Karyos umatensis, was, was, this was actually collected from a cave. It probably came off of a bat. So this is an argacid tick that feeds on bats. And if you'll notice on this baby pallet bat, just for scale, this is uh, clinging to an index finger. So that gives you an idea of the size of this little bat. But you can see some parasites clinging to this little bat. And those are blood sucking mites. So you can also find uh, quite a lot of different kinds of mites in caves but many of them are detritivores and very small. So I'm just gonna show you this one blood sucking mite. Some other blood sucking parasites that are frequently found in caves 
are the comb nose bugs, also known as kissing bugs. So the way that you can always identify these things very readily is this snout that sticks out. It's kind of a cone shape. So all the triatoma have these cone shaped snouts. And I think that that's really the easiest way to, to do a quick ID on these things. And they pronounce them triatoma. Probably. Oh, well, I so, said triatoma, but then suddenly. Triatoma protacta, this is triatoma. Okay, and uh, I have found all three of these species, Rubida, Protracta, this is Rubida, and you'll notice once again, this cone-shaped snout. And then here's Recurva, and Recurva looks huge, by the way, when you see that thing, it's, it's they're really impressive. Um, they're nymphs also, you will find in caves. Here's that cone-shaped snout, so they're pretty easy to recognize. And these probably feed on hosts such as pack rats, uh, possibly ringtail cats, quadamundis, raccoons, or other mammals that um, live in the cave, that come in and out of the cave. But these are very frequently found in caves. Another uh, reduvid type of bug that we find in caves are these zelluroides. Now this is a predaceous reduvid, so it feeds on other insects, okay? And a lot of these uh, predaceous reduvids, when they're nymphs, they cover themselves with dirt. So this little zelluroides was found in a cave and was all covered with dirt. And here's a larger one, an older nymph. This is almost mature. And this is what it looked like before it had an, a meal of sucking out an insect. And this is what it looks like when it's done feeding. It looks kind of like a little balloon. But these curved rostrum is sort of a strong indicator that you're dealing with an insectivorous uh, assassin bug rather than a blood sucking triatoma. Triatomas have straight needle like rostrums. And when these things mature, they leave the cave, they can disperse, they have wings, and then they feed on insects, just out on your windowsill or wherever. So once again, they live, they can live in the cave or not live in the cave. They can leave the cave at any time during their life. So they are not obligate cave dwellers. They're, they're basically troglophiles and troglozines. Now here's a true bug that you might not expect to find in a cave because it's a plant hopper. And you might say, what on earth is a plant hopper doing in a cave? And that was a big question I had too. Well, it turns out that a related group of plant hoppers, Succeeds, have, also, have actually undergone adaptive radiation in Hawaiian lava tube caves. Uh, succeeds, if any of you have flipped rocks near the edge of a stream where there's willows, you might have seen the little nymphs under the uh, rocks. They feed on plant roots. And succeed nymphs in, in uh, Hawaii have actually gotten to where generations of them live only in these lava tube caves because plant roots penetrate through into the lava tubes and they can actually continue to feed on plant roots. But this particular uh, plant hopper is a canarid. And what I initially had found in the cave was the nymph. So I collected a nymph like this and didn't know what the heck it was and uh, contacted Lois O'Brien, who is like world authority on fulgoroid type bugs. And she was curious about it. And so she came out and we actually got an adult that very day we collected this adult from the cave. And it's a canard, it's a, it, it is Euclidius. And we, what we think is that these things might be feeding on fungus rather than on plant roots. Um, because I have found them in areas where there's mildew. The adults seem to be um, attracted to mildew areas. And I've never seen any plant roots in this particular cave. So I think that they might feed on fungus, but they are technically plant hoppers. And it's kind of interesting that they're in caves 
and uh, they probably come and go from caves, but but it is of interest that they have been found in caves, both the adults and the nymphs. Now, a common cave inhabitant would be the tenebrionid beetles. So these uh, beetles, this is an ironclad beetle that was found in a cave. And this one here was found in a cave. And I actually raised that up from this that I collected from a cave. So the tenebrionids are kind of like the mealworms, can eat all kinds of uh, detritus. And so they're very common in caves. Another group of beetles that's very common in caves are the staphylinids. And unfortunately, hardly anyone works with staphylinids. So these are unidentified. These were all collected from caves. And as you folks know, staphylinids have these very short elytra. And then they can, they can fold the elytra up I mean, they can fold up their wings under that elytra. So they have these very long wings. And then the, what's amazing to me is that they just fold them right up like that under those little tiny elytra. And it's even better than a pop-up umbrella, you know? Um, but staphylinids are very common in caves and there's probably needs to be a lot of work done on that group. But one of the groups that's most famous in caves for beetles are the Redeen beetles. And one reason why these are commonly found in caves is that one of their primary food sources are the eggs of camel crickets. So camel crickets, you'll see very good sized populations of these things in caves. And they apparently can sometimes leave the cave at night, feed outside of the cave and then come back in the cave. I think that they can also eat detritus uh, associated with uh, bat guano or debris that pack rats bring in. So you can have a nice population of these cave crickets. And typically what these do is they'll lay one egg at a time in the substrate, the, the dirt on the floor of the cave. And the redeen beetles apparently are very good at finding those cricket eggs and feeding on those. But they also feed on other Food. They, they'll scavenge any kind of carrion. So, um, you know, they, they, they're always written about as if they eat exclusively cricket eggs, but I can assure you that they eat other things too. These cave crickets are an extremely important source of food for things like scorpions and some of the larger spiders. And then you have some other groups of arthropods, such as millipedes. This one came from a cave <laughs> in New Mexico near Carlsbad. And it was identified by uh, Bill Shearer. And some of the other millipedes are a little less uh, obligate cave dwellers where you might potentially find them up on the surface like this one here and then here, which unfortunately are unidentified. But these both came from caves. And then you have centipedes. So this one used to be new, uh, known as Scutigera homa. Now it's uh, been renamed Dendrotherua homa. But um, this is a desert centipede. Uh, and these are frequently seen in caves. And then you have Scolopendra heroes. Now Scolopendra heroes is kind of an interesting one because here in the desert, these things can reach a length of seven inches. They're extremely fast and they're venomous. So in some caves, they have been observed feeding on bats. And it was not known whether the Scolopendra that was observed feeding on the bat had actually killed the bat or whether it was scavenging a dead bat that had fallen on the floor. But they are fast, they are venomous. At the size of seven inches, that's big enough to take a bat. And they're really good at climbing up rock walls. So um, these, we do see them in caves and they're certainly something to be reckoned with when you see one, they're, they're pretty impressive. Some other arthropods that you don't wanna forget about are the crustaceans. So you have your isopods. And this one is obviously not specifically cave adapted. It's still got eyes. To me, these things always make me think of uh, 
trilobites, you know? <laughs> they really do look like living trilobites. This was just a little baby one. So it still has the eyes. So that's not a depigmented uh, cave thing. But this one here was collected by a caver and brought to me. And I think that this might have been a troglobitic isopod because I could not see any sign of eyes on this thing. And it was just very, very pale. One of the groups that people uh, see most commonly in caves are spiders. So we have a lot of different uh, recluse type spiders, Loxosceles, and this happens to be Loxosceles sabina. Now the only actual population of these spiders ever known anywhere is one little cave in Arizona. So um, this particular individual of Loxosceles sabina had apparently killed a Pseudoeuroctinus scorpion that was also living in that cave. And sometimes these loxosceles, unlike the ones on the surface, which usually live like under cardboard boxes or under a dead wood or something like that, these ones are already in a dark cave. So they'll just set up their webbing right out in the middle of the floor or on the sides of the walls. They're not undercover because there's no light down there. And they, so you have to be careful because when there's a lot of them there, they can reach, this was only about five inches across from this point to that point. And there were three of them right in this short space. And they were literally almost everywhere on the walls at times in that cave. So you really have to be careful where you put your hands because they have the same sphingomyelinase D that can cause uh, necrosis um, in their venom, the same kind of venom component that's in the famed brown recluse spider in the southeastern United States. And of course, in some caves, you find Loxosceles arizonica. And oddly enough, Loxosceles arizonica, we find on the surface in the same area where Loxosceles sabina is in the cave. And apparently there is no interbreeding between the cave ones and the surface ones. So that's re really interesting. And this is just a view of Loxosceles arizonica. They're very easy to identify because they have only six eyes in three pairs, two here, two here. So it looks like two eyes and a nose. So that's really the best way to identify Loxosceles to genus. And of course the fulcid spiders, which I think of as cellar spiders. Um, some people call them daddy long legs, but that's confusing because there's several different, very unrelated organisms known as daddy long legs. I call them cellar spiders, but fulcids are very commonly found in caves. And you'll notice that this one here is a surface species of fulcid and it has very obvious eyes, okay? And quite a bit of pigment, okay? But the eyes are what's really very obvious in this surface one. And here's another species of fulcid. This is a Silochorus. This is a tiny little one that I found when I flipped a rock on the surface, feeding on a beetle larva. But you can see it's got lots of pigment. Now compare that to this cave fulcid. This thing is, almost completely lacking in pigment. And its eyes are really, really reduced. Uh, in fact, the two middle eyes here are almost uh, vestigial at this point. And even the, the two clusters of three eyes apiece are very reduced in size. And plus it has almost no pigment uh, on its cephalothorax. So this is obviously a troglobitic uh, fulcid spider found right in the same area where those other two fulcids are found on the surface. Here's another troglobitic spider. This is a leptonetid. So this is a darkonetta. <clears throat> and you'll notice once again, very little pigment, virtually no pigment in the cephalothorax. And it's, it has a lot of iridescence. That's very typical of the leptonetids. But the nearest relative to this dark Aneta is in Texas. This one was found in Southern Arizona. There are no other dark Aneta known other than in Texas. And so this is 
its own species for sure. It just hasn't been described. So this is a true troglobitic spider. Okay, so the Theridiids, which are the group to which black widows belong, are very commonly found in caves. So sometimes you find black widows themselves in caves, especially close to the entrance. But here's one called Theridion cochis that was collected from a cave in Southern Arizona. And this was actually a mature female that turned out to be gravid. She produced an egg sac. So in captivity, I was able to raise up babies and observe this uh, extended maternal care of her sharing a fruit fly with her babies, okay? So she's showing subsocial behavior. I raised up the babies to maturity, and that way I got additional mature females and mature males. So I was able to give back a few spiders to be re-released to the cave where the mature female had been collected. And this way we had specimens that could be identified. And also I was able to observe the subsocial behavior in these uh, Theridion cochise where the siblings cooperatively killed prey and shared in prey. So that's one of the benefits of not killing a specimen right away. When you keep it alive, and in the case of that female, she produced an egg sac and I was able to get many more specimens, including a mature male that I had raised up and all these other interesting observations. So there's a lot of benefits to not killing things right away. This is another kind of Theridiid spider. Uh, this is a tiny kind of little relative of the black widow, very, very tiny. And they can live on the surface. When they live on the surface, they like to attach little bits of debris to the outside of their egg sacs. But this one also uh, shows sub, uh, social behavior where it shares prey with its babies. This is the mature female. And just to give you an idea of the size of the spider, she's a mature female spider and this is a, a fruit fly. So she's about half the size of the fruit fly. So you can imagine how tiny her babies are. So some of these cave spiders can be quite uh, minuscule and you have to really be paying attention to collect them. You can see these babies all sharing a fruit fly together cooperatively killing the fruit fly uh, as they work together. Another Theridiid that's interesting is Thymoides minero. The name mineral refers to the fact that initially the first specimens collected were actually collected from abandoned mine shafts. So it was given the name mineral, but it also has been associated with caves. This is a tiny little spider. Some of them can be quite pale. So there's populations in caves and also on the surface, but you'll see the eyes are quite tiny, reduced. So it doesn't really use its eyes for catching prey. It, it uses a little bit of cobwebby type silk and um, is already adapted for living in dark, hidden little places. So it's, it's pre-adapted for caves. And one that looks almost identical, the Thymoides minero, is Eidmanella pallida. And Eidmanella pallida actually belongs to a sister family, the Nesticidae, um, a, a, a group of spiders that's um, very closely related to the uh, black widows and, and their relatives. But this Eidmanella pallida has been found once again in dark, cool, moist places like under logs and forests and such, but also in caves, including Karchner Caverns, which is in the foothills of the Whetstone Mountains in Southern Arizona. So that's pretty low desert, Karchner Caverns. And there's no way that this little spider would survive in the low desert. It's pretty much, that population is pretty much isolated in that cave. So they're probably in the process of speciating and becoming troglobitic in that cave. Okay, Uliboris are interesting. Uh, the family Uliboridae are the only family of spiders that completely lack venom. 
And so they have to immobilize their prey by wrapping it very tightly with silk. They'll actually spin the prey like a rotisserie chicken really fast as they're wrapping it up with silk. And then they'll just feed right through the silk. But sometimes they're found in caves. And among the spiders with latigrade legs, in other words, legs that are flat to the surface so that they, they can uh, live on vertical surfaces readily, are Lariceus hookai and the Selenops actophilus. Now this Selenops, this was a big female Selenops, the biggest one I've ever seen, and she was in colossal caves. So um, sometimes they can get quite large, especially if there's a good population of those camel crickets. And um, among the uh, megalomorph spiders, relatives of tarantulas, our euagris are frequently found in caves. They uh, build a little sort of a, a sheet web, funnel web type of a setup like under a rock. And um, they're, they're much smaller than a lot of the tarantulas that you've seen. Probably one of the most specialized spiders are spitting spiders. So um, Scytodes is the genus for spitting spiders, and they have this high-domed cephalothorax, which houses a very large glue silk gland, as well as a venom gland. And their method of prey capture is unique among the spiders, as far as I know anyway. First of all, they don't detect the, the prey with their eyes. If this cricket was right in front of them, they would not react to it until the cricket touches some part of the spider. And then at that point, what they do is they squirt out two streams of a mixture of glue and silk. And that's a close up. And you can see how tiny their fangs are. And here's the streams of glue and silk coming out. That's why they're called spitting spiders. And the Fangs oscillate back and forth very rapidly. So this particular individual was chasing this cricket as she was squirting the mixture of glue and silk. And you can see that the fangs were oscillating because you can see this back and these lines of moisture on this rock as she was chasing the cricket. So it looks almost like a barcode at the grocery store, but it's actually uh, lines of glue and silk that she was squirting out. So the fangs oscillate back and forth at a rate of an average rate of somewhere around 850 hertz, which is 850 back and forth rotations per second, per second, okay? And at the same time, the entire spitting sequence lasts only about 25 milliseconds. That's a 40th of a second. So that's a very short little spitting sequence. The fangs are only about 70 microns in length. I, I showed you how tiny her little fangs are, 70 microns in length, which means that when they do the killing bite, they first of all have fastened down the cricket very securely. You'll notice that this glue and silk, it actually starts to contract as soon as she squirts it. So it ties down the cricket very securely, and then she can bite, do the killing bite in a thin area of the cuticle, such as the leg joint. And that's the only way that she can really get those tiny fangs through that area and kill the cricket. So once she does the killing bite, she carries it off. So those fangs are only 70 microns in length. That's about the same width as the average human hair. So they're very, very tiny fangs. So these spitting spiders are kind of special and they're, they're very well adapted to living in caves. Um, this particular species is actually one that has uh, been, it's not native to the US, it's, it's originally native to Southeast Asia, I believe. It's Scytodes univitata, but it's appearing here and there in the United States including in at least one cave and it feeds on the camel crickets very readily in there. And one last organism I want to talk about are palpigrades. They are arachnids. They are very tiny. They can live in the interstitial areas of soils. They have no eyes. So they're already 
sort of pre-adapted to living in dark areas. Um, one thing that makes them seem to be pre-adapted for caves is that it's believed that they might be able to scrape off cyanobacteria from the surfaces of rocks and feed on that. There's some cave palpigrades in Europe that somebody did some scanning electron microscopy on or, or transmission microscopy. And they found what appeared to be cyanobacteria in the guts of these palpigrades. But they can also catch columbola with these rather large chelicerae that they have. So the thing is, is that they, um, they might be able to live on rather low uh, availability of food in a cave by either scraping cyanobacteria or catching palpigrades uh, or catching uh, columbola. These have been documented at least, well, we know of at least two cases of caves in Southern Arizona with these, uh, pa with palpigrades. Uh, many years ago, Cal Wellborn did a survey of Karchner Caverns and found one palpigrade. And then there's at least one other cave in Southern Arizona that we know that palpigrades occur in. Um, in Europe, They've been documented in a number of caves and some are clearly uh, troglobitic. And also in South America, there have been a number of troglobitic palpigrades documented from caves. So these, these there's probably more palpigrades, but they, they're um, difficult to see. They're quite tiny, including the flagellum. A palpigrade is only about a half a millimeter long. You know, so you're talking, well, maybe a millimeter long, including the flagellum for a nice big one. So they're really quite small. So I wanna go in through a few things to do with cave conservation. First of all, <coughs> photograph in situ if possible, collect sparingly, populations are small. And this is something that I especially wanted to mention to, to folks that are, um, used to that are entomologists because typically, with the exception of a few rare butterflies and such, most entomologists feel that they can collect a whole series of insects and that insects are incredibly good at bouncing back, uh, that their numbers can recover very readily. Um, but in caves, remember their, their metabolism is slower, their fecundity is lower, it takes them longer to mature. So their populations might be slow and they might not recover populations as readily. Uh, consider capture and release. For example, if you can just photograph something and then release it back into the cave. Um, live observation yields more information than immediate preservation. And so in the case of that Theridion cochise, I was able to get much more from a live specimen than I would have been able to do if it had been um, preserved right away. This is some of the collecting gear that I use. Uh, I use an aspirator um, with, with a vial, but sometimes for very delicate things, I just use a little paintbrush and the vial because the aspirator might be too, too um, damaging for a really delicate spider. And one thing I thought that I'd mention is that there's um, several other factors to take into consideration. First of all, if you don't have connections with someone who can properly identify or describe the specimen, then it's probably better not to collect it at all. And describing specimens, you folks are entomologists, so I know that you know that, that, that there's a lot of work involved in describing a specimen, uh, a new species. It's not something where you go and you, you collect and you go, oh, yay, now I can name it. You know, it doesn't work like that. It's, it's a lot of work because you have to go through all the other uh, species that is in that genus and prove that your organism is a new species. And, and it's an incredible amount of work. So unless you know somebody that is ready and willing to either identify it or, or at least get it into a collection somewhere where it can eventually be uh, 
described by somebody, then don't don't collect it. If it's just going to sit at home on your shelf, don't don't collect it. Just photograph it in situ. Um, the other things that I wanted to mention on cave conservation is that uh, white nose syndrome is a very big deal. So please observe all uh, recommendations. If you're going into more than one cave, make sure that you disinfect your clothing and stuff like that so that you do not spread white nose from one cave to another uh, inadvertently because you never know for certain uh, where the white nose might have been introduced. And never go into a cave that has a bat um, brood roost where the mother bats are raising their babies. During that period of time, you do not want to be going into caves uh, where you, know, you might disturb the, the mother bats or the babies. Um, and last but not least, bear in mind that things like climate change and over pumping of water tables can have disastrous effects on caves. Um, the bat population in my area seems to have crashed um, in terms of the pallet bats. And I think it's due to the fact that the insect population really dropped in the past 10 years due to, I'm, I'm assuming to drought, uh, that there's just much fewer insects, the diversities and numbers of insects are decreased. Um, that's reflected in hard data in terms of things like the butterfly counts that are done annually. Um, the numbers of species are definitely down and overall numbers of, of individuals are down. So I think that that has impacted populations of bats. And that in turn has an effect on, on cave uh, life because I really think the bats could be basically like keystone species for caves, even though they're only troglozenic. Um, and the other thing is, of course, climate change and over pumping of groundwater might have negative impacts on, on uh, cave organisms that require humidity and moisture. So I want to just give thanks to some of these folks and open it up to questions. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I'll ask one. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Am I? OK. Uh, could you describe your general collecting techniques? Are you just going around uh, aspirating all these things? I saw the little paintbrush. But yeah. uh, just so could you for describe? The for the most part, um, I, I kind of use 50-50 paintbrush aspirator. If it looks like a robust enough animal, I can use the aspirator or sometimes the aspirator is, is um, you know, for something really big like a beetle or a, or a kissing bug, you know, you don't really need the aspirator. You just use a paintbrush to chivy it into the, the vial. But on the really delicate spiders like the Darkonetta and the little uh, cave troglobitic fulcid spider, those were extremely tiny and very, very delicate. And I, I just used the paintbrush <laughs> and very, very carefully got them into the vial. Um, the aspirator would have been too harsh on them, I, I think. Have so, you ever had any concern about uh, picking up uh, diseases from the bats no. or from other things? <laughs> no, and I'm really bad because I just use the aspirator and I've probably breathed in all kinds of, of uh, fungal organ fungal stuff. Um, there are aspirators that are designed so that you can blow out rather than suck in, you know, to, instead of aspirating, it basically uses a, a, some other method of sucking it up. But um, I've never bothered to get those. To be honest with you, it doesn't worry me though that much. You know, I've probably had valley fever already. It's one of those things. I've, I've aspirated across the entire United States, Canada, and Mexico, and I've never had a problem. And then I, I meet other people who are afraid to even go out into nature because they're afraid. Yeah. Well, you figure, 
You know, as a, as a clinical microbiologist, one of the, I remember at an ASM conference, an uh, American Society of Microbiology conference where there's like thousands of people attending, um, Dr. Sobel was uh, based out of Phoenix. And when he would give a talk about um, valley fever, he'd always show this big slide of one of those haboob uh, dust clouds coming in behind the city of Phoenix, you know, where there's one of these massive dust clouds. And he'd say, well, there's a whole bunch of, you know, valley fever in that <laughs> dust cloud. <laughs> so when you live in Arizona, I mean, you're being exposed to it all the time. It, it's really, you just figure, oh, well, you know, it's part of life, you know. Yeah, I, um, uh, in my collecting, I have found that uh, I, I was seeing a close association between a lot of these things like uh, some of the species of scorpions, the cellar spiders, the, the loxosceles uh, mm -hmm. associated with rodent burrows. Ah, yes, rodent burrows, yeah. And, 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 and black widows, believe it or not, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I strongly suspect that a lot of the, uh, the, the gene flow might be occurring uh, through rodent burrows because you've got uh, whole populations of uh, things that are living in like uh, the like a uh, pack rat nests and it's not very well studied and if you're out there collecting like me with my uh, I call it my pneumo, pneumo inoculator <laughs> um, <laughs> and you're shoving a, a hose underneath a rock with a uh, rats and uh, and you're taking yeah. a deep breath uh, I'm sure I've been exposed to hantavirus and everything else um, but there's a lot of associated uh, arthropods in the the rodent nests. That's probably yeah. a big area of research that needs to be yeah. examined. Yeah, we actually did some work um, with uh, Carolina Reisman, um, who was studying triatoma, the kissing okay. bugs. And so we set up some hobo units, uh, these ones that do long-term data um, uh, recording of temperature and humidity, and we put them in pack rat nests, both on the surface and in caves, because she was interested in, in where um, kissing bugs were living. And that particular cave that where I found a lot of these specimens in the Rincon foothills is a really warm, humid cave, and, and it was running about 75 it was running a steady 75 degrees winter and summer and um, down in the cave and it was very humid. So you picture an animal that's adapted to, you know, 75 degrees steady, I mean, without variation and a nice constant humidity trying to survive when it's like 115 degrees out and 10% humidity. There's just no way that some of those little organisms can do that. So they are truly troglobites. I mean, by my definition, anyway, of of an obligate cave dwelling organism that that generations of them live there, and none of them ever live outside of the cave. Thanks, Jillian. Great talk, and I really like your photos. I'm wondering how many of these did you manage to take in situ or? Um, not a lot of them. Most of them, in fact, quite a few of these organisms were captured by cavers and brought to me. <laughs> ah. so a lot of them, yeah, most of the, some of the little thistlecinas, like the, the PTI from the Santa Rita's came from a caver that was down there. Um, but. You know, I, I do try to photograph some things in situ. Many a time I have kicked myself for not bringing a camera down in there because I'll see, I'll see a scorpion with a camel cricket or a pseudoscorpion with a, a sosid or something like that, and I, and I didn't have my camera with me. So. But there's a limit to crawling around. Um, actually, my caving days are pretty much done because my knees are no good anymore and my back. It's so. better to have people bring him to you and you can sit <laughs> yeah. and photograph them in the comfort of your lab. Yeah. And, and you know, the, in some of those areas, you just cannot bring a camera. I mean, it's too... Oh, one thing I, I neglected to mention on, on cave conservation, 
is if you happen to find a rattlesnake in a cave, do not kill it. Um, that has actually happened more than once that I know of, uh, including me going in the cave where, where there was a rattlesnake in there. Um, and we didn't realize it until almost stepping on it. And But you want to respect the fact that they're using the cave. Um, they're going in and out. And, and just because humans feel uncomfortable around them doesn't mean that they should be killed. A lot of people, for some reason, feel like rattlesnakes aren't... Uh, given the same protection as, say, a bat, you know? And, and you really, you have to protect them all. Um, and the other thing I thought I'd mention is, if you go in caves, always go with other people. Never, ever go by yourself. Um, and always make sure that you have the proper equipment. So that's just a couple more safety issues. So oh, Julian, you were, you were talking about hot, super hot caves. You know, the hottest cave in southern Arizona is Cave of the Bells. It's oh, not yeah. Only, it's not only the hottest cave, but it's also the, probably the most humid cave as well. I don't know if you've been in there. I have not, uh, but my spouse has, Bill Savory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's been well, I've been there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's an interesting one. Uh, Sarah Truby has done a lot of work on that one. Uh, where she collected, I believe, a lot of the water that was dripping down and figuring out which um, which cycles of moisture that water was coming from. In other words, we normally, well, we, we used to have two rainy seasons, winter and summer, and those rainy seasons uh, originate from different parts of different areas of ocean. So the summer monsoons come up basically from Mexico and the winter rains come more from California. And um, and they can actually look at the isotopes of water, like isotopes in the in the water and determine whether it was from summer rain or winter rain. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. um, so she was looking at some of that stuff in the Cave bells. of the Bells. And, and somebody got lost in Cave of the Bells and they were, they actually, <laughs> yeah, and they were, they actually, they spent, the they spent the weekend in Cave of the Bells before they figured out, before they were rescued or whatever, but they went and found all Sarah Truby's little water collection things and they drank all the water, <laughs> which was really annoying <laughs> for her. <laughs> so there, yeah. There's a lot of caves where people get lost, especially in California. <laughs> Yeah, safety is something that, that you really have to think about. Caving is probably one of the most dangerous uh, recreational sports you can do. Cave, um, cave, cave diving is especially dangerous. Yeah, cave diving is incredibly <laughs> dangerous. I would never do that. Um, but, you know, but the lure of finding little critters, I have gone into places that I never thought I could make it into, you know, and it's just... If, if somebody says, but I saw some really neat little animals, it's like, okay, I gotta get in there. <laughs> but, but there is a cave that I was not able to get into um, about a year ago that I tried, that palp grades have been seen in. And the person that, re that remembered it said, oh, it's not that bad. There's a little squeeze in the be near the beginning and then it's really easy. Well, it wasn't easy. It was, it, I couldn't get through. I couldn't get through, but the two guys did manage to get through. But it took a it took a person that uh, was willing to leave a little blood on the walls, you know, to get through. There was some of the rocks were kind of nasty, so yeah. Are, are you familiar with the uh, Western Cave Conservancy? Uh, no, I had you know. In recent years, I haven't really been doing a lot of caving, but um, okay. But it's, I do know some of the basic conservation issues. Oh. OK. Are there any other questions? Well, one thing that I, I didn't mention that sometimes is, is kind of handy <laughs> um, are mite culture vials. And Cal Wellborn. Um, supplies me with mite culture vials because I've sent him a lot of mites but um, over the years. But 
But those are basically, you can make up your own vials if you can get a hold of some glass vials. They're basically little glass jars with very tight fitting lids. And he makes a mixture of 10% uh, finely ground charcoal and plaster of Paris. And he mixes the charcoal and plaster of Paris together. And then he's, he, he like half fills the vial and swirls around on the inside of the vial and lets it harden. And what you do is you let it harden and then you pre-moisten that. And, and I've kept palpigrades alive for as long as a week in those mic culture vials without them drying out or, or drowning, so. Yes. My professor at Cal State Northridge was a columbola specialist, and that's exactly how he raised all of his columbola. He had little ah. uh, finger bowls with the plaster of Paris charcoal mixture, yeah. and he would put some uh, yeast in there, and you would watch the columbola grazing on the uh, on, on the charcoal. And I don't know if they were eating some fungus or, or bacteria growing on the charcoal, but it, they immediately seemed to get to it, and they, they seemed to be f grazing the charcoal so yeah it's not surprising well the reason why the mite culture vials work so well mm. for palpigrades and for other very delicate the really super delicate things um and tiny stuff is because the you can saturate that plaster of paris charcoal with water and then it doesn't it's you get like 100 percent relative humidity in your vial without condensation drops forming on glass because the condensation drops forming are what drown a lot of little animals when you keep them in vials so the idea is to have all that humidity and moisture without deadly droplets forming so um so for people that are really interested in this i would highly recommend looking into making up some of those vials do you, you actually coat the entire inside of the vial or just the almost bottom? the entire thing and and the lid you know the underside of the lid does form a little bit of condensation but you can wipe that dry every like once a day and let just the tiniest amount of droplets form but you don't want big drops to form because many a small spider has drowned in a little drop of water and yeah. how do you get oxygen into the tube oh tube? they you know what they the amount of air in that little vial is plenty, really. Honestly, for most of these little critters, they can live a week in that vial and it's not going to bother them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my collection vials, uh, if I was collecting live specimens, I used to use film canisters with just a pinhole in the top. And a pinhole is all the oxygen any arthropod needs yeah. for months. Uh, yeah. And, and, and it's they prevents them from desiccating too fast. Right. The little... The plastic clear vials that I would frequently collect things into, um, those are nice for being able to see into. And for, for larger size spiders, they're, they're fine, as long as the spider isn't going to drown in a little tiny drop. Um, they're fine. And in fact, in those, I would always take a little like fingernail sized piece of tissue and moisten it and stick it inside the vial. And that you always want a little little source of moisture, but not like soggy wet because it will form those condensation drops faster than you can believe. Yeah. So you had mentioned the uh, tenebrionid beetles. But uh -huh. you, you showed, you know, uh, things that are found on the surface easy. But there right. are two cave endemic large tenebrionids in Arizona, but they're oh. mainly up in northern uh, Arizona. Okay. Uh, one around uh, Tano Natural Bridge. Okay. And one up in the Grand Canyon Caves. Okay. I know that the Grand Canyon Caves, there's been a lot of work done on those. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And yeah. I just haven't been privy to those. So, so um, one of the other, the other families of beetles that you didn't mention that's very commonly found in caves are spider beetles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those are great <laughs> little ones. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, just for time limitations, I thought right, I'd right, right. home in on the most, you know, obvious ones. But, right. but you're right. Some of those little spider beetles are kind of neat, too. <clears throat> so, so, you know, this was not a comprehensive uh, survey of, of stuff, but it kind of introduces you to some of the basic ideas of what is a troglobite and uh, some of the more commonly encountered stuff.
in terms of groups of animals, like scorpions, pseudoscorpions, spiders, some of the beetles, things like that. Um, and, and of course, some of the parasites, I think are, I've seen an awful lot of kissing bugs in caves. So I'm, that's why I thought I'd better include those. I see that Brian has uh, put a question in the chat. Okay. Um, it's hmm. longer there. Okay. Um, I can read it if you want. Sure. Besides bats and snakes, have you encountered cave specialist amphibian or fish that are in enough water that are part of the food chain or food webs or are these caves overall generally not containing enough standing or flowing water? The Arizona caves, I have not heard of any amphibians or fish in Arizona caves. So those are primarily associated with caves like in, uh, in uh, southeastern United States and Texas, I believe, has some of that stuff. Um, but Arizona does not have that. So, so, but I think it's important to, to think about that kind of stuff because um, in theory, if you're caving and you know, if you're not taking precautions, you could be transferring chytrid to, you know, if you're going to an area that has salamanders, you don't want to transfer chytrid to that. You know, same kind of precautions because of white nose and chytrid. You, you'd want to make sure that your shoes are pretty much disinfected and things like that. Let's see. It'll be posted so I can catch what I missed. Um, this question is about the recording and will it be posted? And since I, I am doing the report recording, yes, I do record it. And then Blaine sends out a link for it. Uh, you can contact Blaine for that. Uh, and usually they're up for a month until the next speaker uh, speaks. I'll, I'll do a review of the meeting uh, and um, send it out soon, and it'll include recording links and any other additional questions or information, like how to contact Jillian or any other information we need to. Yeah. So thanks to everyone for showing up. And caving is probably one of the most exciting adventures you can do, but do it use your brain, you know, go with other people, have the right equipment. Don't collect if you're not gonna do something with the specimen, um, stuff like that. Well, Jillian, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I'm glad I invited you. I'm glad you were able to present it. Um, I hope to perhaps uh, hear more if you're doing any other additional work or talk in the future, but uh, uh, we appreciate it. I will send out a review of today's talk and some additional information about links and recordings and uh, other information about Lorquin, like upcoming meetings, uh, the Natural History Museum news and things like that. We do need uh, participants and volunteers for the upcoming insect fair. So if anybody has any interest in participating with the insect fair, please uh, consider volunteering. Um, and uh, so does anybody else have any questions or issues? So, um, all right. Thank you, Jillian. Okay. <laughs>